Good afternoon. In this webinar, we'll be discussing about supportive care for a baby who is on respiratory support. The objectives of this presentation are to know about the essential requirement for a baby who is on respiratory support in terms of equipments and staff, the need for ongoing assessment, and how to ensure optimal care for a baby who is on respiratory support. We all know that besides equipment and gadgets, one needs a dedicated and a trained team to achieve optimal outcomes. We all will agree that it is not the machines, but the team behind the machines, which make a difference in the outcomes. One also needs a good infrastructure to ensure proper delivery of the care and to decrease the chances of nosocomial infection. In order to detect the complications early and prevent both short and long-term morbidities, one needs a good laboratory backup round the clock. This slide shows the common gadgets and equipments which are required in the NICU. We need a TPS or an AMBU bag for neonatal resuscitation. The advantage with TPS is that it can also provide PWEP and we can monitor the pressures which we are delivering to the baby. One also needs a suction device which should be in a working order along with a disposable suction catheter. One needs a device with interface for delivering the respiratory support to the baby. One also needs to monitor saturation and vitals and for that we need a pulse oximeter. All the infusions, drugs, fluids in a neonate should be given by infusion pump. Although air leaks are rare, but they are a cause of serious concern and constitute a neonatal respiratory emergency. Therefore, one also needs to have an ICD set in place. We also need a portable X-ray machine in the NICU for early detection of the disease and to detect complications like air leak. A blood gas analyzer is also required while caring for a sick baby or a baby who is on respiratory support. The team should be both good in quantity as well as quality. The ideal nurse patient ratio in an ICU should be one is to one. The staff does not comprise only of the doctor but should also have good mix of sisters and other supporting sister staff. The staff should be supportive and should be willing to learn and learn from the mistakes. They should be humane to all the newborns. They should be dedicated and motivated to work hard in order to achieve better outcomes and they should be supportive of each other. According to the Indian guidelines, we require a hundred square feet space for each bed. There should be proper infrastructure to maintain temperature between 26 to 28 degrees Celsius. There should be proper lightning throughout the nursing areas. There should be continuous electric supply and a backup. And to prevent asepsis, one should have adequate hand washing facilities and hand rub in all the areas where new units are being cared. Besides common routine investigations like CBC, bilirubin electrolytes, one needs to have a portable X-ray machine for early diagnosis and for diagnosing complications like pneumothorax. It is good to have an ultrasound machine to detect early complications like intraventricular intracranial hemorrhage. ECHO is a good bedside tool to detect early shock Ultrasound machine can also be used to detect line position, AT tube position, and also detect various respiratory conditions like respiratory distress syndrome, TTNB, but it needs expertise. Moving further, the ongoing assessment should be focused and thorough. The ongoing assessment should be of the patient, the interface, and the device. The patient assessment begins with the, the general assessment. It also includes 
evaluation of the cardiorespiratory system and other systemic examination. However, one should not forget to monitor vitals as they tell us about the cardiorespiratory st status and the stability of the neonate. They should be monitored frequently. The aim of the general physical examination is to get an overall impression of the neonate to know whether the newborn is sick or stable. The general physical examination is usually an early diagnostic tool for a neonatologist. Therefore, a neonatologist should have a keen sense of observation and majority of the diagnosis in neonatology can be done with the examination alone. The examination should include color, activity, whether the baby has spontaneous activity or there is paucity of movement. Also, one should record whether there are any abnormal body movements. The breathing should be assessed by monitoring the respiratory rate, signs of increased work of breathing like nasal flaring, grunt, retractions. Vital signs should be monitored frequently depending on the severity of the condition and these include heart rate, respiratory rate, capillary refill time, saturation, temperature and blood pressure. Remember that no sign is diagnostic of shock. Therefore, multiple signs have to be taken into consideration for diagnosing a shock. One should also remember that fall in blood pressure is a late sign of shock and one should not wait for the blood pressure to fall before starting the therapy. Also, it's important to remember that excess of CPAP pressure or excess of PEEP can itself be sometimes cause of decreased perfusion because of the rise in intrathoracic pressure. We all know that the most common indication for putting a baby on respiratory support is inadequate respiratory efforts or increased work of breathing. Therefore, it is imperative to assess the respiratory system. Although there are multiple scoring systems to assess the respiratory system, but Silverman Anderson's retraction scoring is the best to assess the FRC of a preterm neonate. Therefore, it is used more frequently. It essentially consists of five clinical signs, namely upper chest retractions, lower chest retractions, xiphoid retraction, dilatation of the nares, and expiratory grant. Each of these scores is given a score of zero to two, two signifying severe respiratory distress. What is important to remember is that the upper chest and lower chest does not mean essentially the radiological compartments of the chest, but here a line is drawn in the mid clavicular, is drawn in the mid axillary line and the area above the mid axillary line is called the upper chest and the area below the mid axillary line is called the lower chest. A score of more than seven signifies impending respiratory failure. Any preterm baby who presents with respiratory distress is a candidate for CPAP. For a term baby, any score more than three should alert us for starting CPAP for that baby. One should also remember that a single score is not important, but one has to monitor the trend. Therefore, it should be done frequently and on daily basis. Also, apart from the clinical signs, one should assess the sensorium because the prerequisite for non-respiratory support is that the baby should have spontaneous respiratory efforts. Therefore, monitoring of the sensorium is very important. And decrease in sensorium or altered sensorium may be an indicator of underlying hypoxia. And therefore, clinicians should always be alert to alteration of sensorium. Also, before deciding about the response to therapy, the clinician should also take into account the degree of the respiratory support, whether there has been an escalation or decrease in the need for the respiratory support. Moving to the other systems, as we have discussed that it is important to monitor the baby's sensorium, his activity, his tone, responsiveness, and respiratory drive. In order to get an idea about the cardiorespiratory system, one needs to assess the pulse volume, all peripheral pulses, pulse pressure, urine output, and blood pressure. For monitoring blood pressure, one should ensure proper cuff size, otherwise the values can be erroneous. Any baby who is on respiratory support should have an orogastric tube in place and should be opened after 30 minutes of feeding 
to vent off the gas that has passed in the stomach. Remember, any abdominal distension can lead to respiratory embarrassment by preventing lungs to expand. Therefore, abdominal distension should be avoided for a baby on respiratory support. For CPAP, if the baby is on CPAP, we need to monitor the CPAP pressure, the amount of FI2, and for a bubble CPAP, there should be a continuous bubbling both during inspiration and expiration, and the flow should be just enough to ensure bubbling both during inspiration as well as expiration. For HHFNC, we need to monitor the flow and the FIR2. And if the baby is on a non-invasive mechanical ventilation, one needs to monitor PIP, PWEP, and FIR2 and the rate, just like mechanical ventilation. A pulse oximeter is an important gadget in the nursery because both hypoxia and hypoxia can be dangerous for a neonate. Hypoxia can lead to increased NEC and mortality, whereas hyperoxia can lead to increased respiratory morbidity in terms of BPD. Therefore, one should always have a pulse oximeter in place for a baby who's on respiratory support or a sick baby. However, remember that pulse oximeter uses infrared rays to detect the signals. Therefore, it generates heat. And therefore, it is important to ensure that the probe is rotated during a shift to prevent burn injuries. Before interpreting the results of saturation, one should ensure that there is a proper waveform. There is a proper waveform. The phototherapy, which is given for the jaundice, may cause interference with the results. Therefore, the probe has to be shielded from phototherapy. Set technology, which is used for Massimo, takes care of some of the moment artifacts and low perfusion state to give a proper reading. Remember that for every preterm and term baby, it is important to maintain saturation between 90 to 95. Therefore, the alarm limit should be set at 89 and 95. Remember that X-ray is not a routine investigation. It is required mainly during the initial period for diagnosis and whenever there is any deterioration. Same is the two for blood gas analysis. Recently, the ultrasound has been used and has almost replaced X-ray in many of the units because there is no risk of radiation and can be repeated multiple times. However, it needs expertise and once the expertise are there, it can be used to detect different lung conditions like respiratory distress, effusion, TTNB, and others. Also, it can be used to detect position of the line and other important issues like intraventricular hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage, and NEC. One of the easiest and the bedside tool to detect pneumothorax is a cold light by doing a transfilmation test, one can easily detect pneumothorax. However, small pneumothoraxes may be missed. Any baby who is has impaired perfusion needs to have an echocardium cardiogram done to assess the cause of the shock, which can be either because of the hypoperfusion or because of the decreased contractility. Therefore, one has to look for IVC collapsibility. Also, in preterm babies, one of the common indication of doing an echocardiogram is to detect PDA, that is patent ductus arteriosus, which can cause hypoperfusion. Also, a baby who is not maintaining saturation and has rapid deterioration, one can use echocardiogram to look for PPHN. For preventing nasal injury, care of the interface is very important. The interface size and position are, at most of, of, are of utmost importance to prevent nasal injury because of the CPAP and other respiratory devices. One has to look for nasal symmetry. Also, one has to look for the columella and the skin around the nose for any signs of hyperemia, blanching, perfusion, and excoriation. And during each shift, the short nasal prongs or the interface should be repositioned to prevent any injuries.
besides correct size and position one should ensure that there is a distance of at least 2 to 3 mm between the nasal prongs and the septum and it should not be abutting around the uh, abutting on the septum always ensure to use skin friendly tapes like tegaderm canulid below the interface to prevent skin underlying skin from injuries and always limit the amount of tape because during removal one can inadvertently cause excoriation of the skin therefore one should dry the tape with a cotton soaked gauze with a saline soaked gauze or cotton for easy removal of the tape these are some of the nasal injuries and they can be prevented with various commercial available tapes and preparations to the left we can see a canulid which can be placed over the nares and after which the interface can be fitted so that the underlying skin is prevented from injury and on the right we see a tegaderm which is again a protective layer which is placed below the interface on the nose and the septum any baby who is on respiratory support and has nasal prongs in position he is ought to have increased secretions it is important to remove these secretions to prevent airway narrowing and increase work of breathing increased secretions can lead to increased work of breathing respiratory distress obstructive apneas desaturations and very rarely pneumothorax it is also important to monitor the color consistency and quantity of these secretions however one should avoid immediate suction after surfactant for 2 to 3 hours in order to prevent aspiration of the surfactant what is optimal positioning any position that promotes comfort and keeps the airway open is an optimal position usually we prefer prone positions although there is not a robust evidence for the same it is important to prevent excessive flexion extension and rotation of the head and neck and remember that during repositioning one has to ensure that the interface is in nose and is in position to deliver the respiratory support to the baby one should change, frequently change the position every 3 to 6 hourly from prone to supine or from supine to side lying positions in order to prevent any excoriations and allowing the clinician for proper examination of the baby remember nutrition is the corner store for each and every baby whether he is sick or healthy therefore nutrition should be an emergency just like we have temperature air everything a circulation nutrition should also ensuring nutrition should also be an emergency for a clinician one should start enteral feeds as soon as possible preferably with mother's only own milk if for reasons one cannot start feeding for example severe shock or there is a surgical abdomen one should start early tpn during the first day of life remember if you are giving abm human milk fortifier should be a norm for all vlbw babies and a baby who is preterm should receive adequate calcium and phosphorus to prevent osteopenia prematurity remember that osteopenia or prematurity is seen up to 40% of the vlbw babies and it is one of the causes of prolonged respiratory support one should also ensure proper care leaves for a baby who is on respiratory support in this diagram to the right we have seen an abdominal x ray and most often such x ray causes alarm to the clinician however it is important to remember that a baby who is on cpap such gas resistance is a benign phenomena and is often called as cpap belly therefore ensuring an orogastric tube for a baby on respiratory support is important to prevent this aerophagy so that that any gas which goes into the stomach is vented off remember that this condition does not require cessation of feeding and is a benign phenomena cpap in itself or mechanical ventilation are not a contraindication for feeding if baby is stable sepsis is a part and parcel of intensive care unit therefore preventing asepsis should be our forte and first and foremost easiest way to prevent sepsis is meticulous hand washing hand washing should be a norm for all staff 
and the family members who are visiting the NICU. Inside the NICU, one can use hand up consisting of more than 70% alcohol in between the patients if the hands are not soiled. It is good to use disposable circuits rather than reusable circuits if one can afford. Again, giving exclusively breastfeed is an important way of preventing sepsis in neonates. Also, it is good to have bundle approach for a baby who is on receiving intensive care. And similarly, one such bundle is CLAPSI, that is central line associated blood stream infection, which includes proper aseptic procedure, following a checklist, hub cleaning, and removing the line as soon as possible. Remember that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Also, the main motive of today's neonatal care is not just survival, it is intact survival. Therefore, consider all babies who are undergoing intensive care as potentially developmentally impaired. Therefore, one should start early intervention and one should ensure a proper development supportive care and environment for these babies. There should be limitation of the sound and one should avoid bedside discussions, high alarm sounds and other noises in the NICU. One should promote dimming of lights to ensure sleep cycle. The baby should be properly positioned, facilitated tucking, non to sucking, and kangaroo mother care are some of the cost-effective interventions which can be done in the NICU to promote developmental supportive care. Also remember that pain management with the help of facilitative tucking, KMC, breast milk is an important intervention and they should be preferred over pharma pharmacological interventions like paracetamol and fentanyl. It's also important to remember that sedative should not be used for a baby who is on non-invasive respiratory support. Also, they are not a norm for a baby who is on mechanical ventilation. In today's world of medical legal litigations, it is important to keep record of every procedure. Therefore, before starting respiratory support, it is good to take consent from the parents or guardians. Also, when you are giving donor ABM in conditions where mother's own milk is not available, it is good to start it after taking consent from the family. Always remember to put notes in an legible handwriting. Daily monitoring charts should include date and time and the signature of the staff on duty. Remember to maintain drug charts on day-to-day -day basis based on weight and one should always check for dose, route and accurate timings. It is important to pen down various investigations including X-ray and blood gases to ensure proper monitoring of the baby. Remember that nutrition is the key for both short and long-term outcomes and an easy way to monitor the growth is by plotting anthropometric measures on growth chart according to your NIC protocol where it should be at least done daily with an electronic weighing scale and length and head circumference have to be done at least once weekly in order to monitor growth and head size. This is one of the monitoring charts for a baby who's on CPAP and includes time, heart rate, respiratory rate, slow medicine score, CRT, CPAP pressure, saturation, FIR2, flow rate, urine output, and abdominal girth. And has to be monitored. This monitoring sheet has to be filled every two to three hourly. Similar monitoring sheets are also available for interface and have to be maintained properly. In this summary, the supportive care is like hypothalamic pituitary axis, where patient is pituitary and doctor and his staff are like hypothalamus. The right feedback from the patient and the right amount and right timing of treatment can save a baby. Every patient requires early diagnosis and management and his response to that treatment should allow us to tailor made the treatment for that baby to ensure best outcomes for that baby. 
so the take home messages for this webinar are that for any intensive care unit we need to have a dedicated team it is not an individual job meticulous monitoring cannot be replaced with gadgets one needs to have a human approach for the units and other patients documentation in today's world is must and there is no escape from that good communication and early involvement of the parents can prevent complications thank you